it's our pleasure to hear from Christine Hong. Christine is an assistant professor at UC Santa Cruz where she specializes in transnational Asian American Korean diaspora and the critical Pacific Rim studies. She is a co-editor of the Critical Asian Studies Special Edition on North Korean Human Rights. She is a member of the National Campaign to End the Korean War, the Alliance of Scholars Concerned About Korea, and the Working Group on Peace and Demilitarism in Asia and the Pacific. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. When I was asked to speak at today's rally, I hesitated, I'll be honest, because I have a baby who hates long drives. Um, but what propelled me was the terrible urgency of the present crisis and the absolute necessity for those of us in the anti-nukes anti-war and social justice movements in the United States to mobilize en masse in this moment for peace, to push for peace. And so to that beautiful song that was sung earlier, peace, shalom, salam, also pyeonghwa. Pyeonghwa is peace in Korean. Many of you who have fought for a world without nukes understand that the horror of the atomic bombings in Hiroshima, of the, of the, the atomic bombings of civilian populations at Hiroshima and Nagasaki amount to a terrible stain on the American conscience. Some of you came of age during the era of the brutal American war in Vietnam, and you recall firsthand how youth and conscience-stricken people converged in protest, making that era a watershed moment in the peace movement. In more recent decades, some of you may have taken part in anti-war protests, raising your voices in the lead-up to the unconscionable war in Iraq. These have all been signature moments in the American peace movement. By contrast, North Korea, a country that knows more intimately than almost any other on this earth what it means to be in the crosshairs of the U.S. war machine, and that the United States has threatened with nu nuclear annihilation on multiple occasions, has hardly occasioned any organized grassroots action. North Korea doesn't weigh on the conscience of the American public, but it should. Most Americans have no sense of how intimately the crisis with North Korea is shaped by the ugly and reckless adventurism of American warmongering and the overwhelming disregard that most Americans demonstrate when the deaths of others as a result of our brutal foreign policy occurs far from our shores. North Korea comes to us in media portraits, not in its complex truth but as a simultaneously cartoonish and demonized portrait that is filtered through a fog of war, so shrouded in jingoistic rhetoric that too many of us, not necessarily us here, but too many in this country, consent to its apocalyptic destruction in advance. When asked this past spring to ponder in real terms what it would mean if Trump were to authorize a nuclear strike against North Korea, Senator Lindsey Graham stated, yes, it would be terrible, but the war would be over there. It wouldn't be over here. It would be bad for the Korean Peninsula. It'd be bad for China. It'd be bad for Japan. It'd be bad for South Korea. It would be the end of North Korea, but what it would not do is hit America. This is the complete ignorance of someone who doesn't understand the impact of nuclear weaponry today. Yesterday, we were subjected to Trump's reckless challenge to North Korea, the most terrifying yet that we've seen from his administration. What he stated was that if North Korea continues to make threats, so in other words, speech acts, if North Korea continues to make speech acts against the United States, and he's appearing to draw a red line here, that it will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. Oh, Given that his words fall around the anniversary of the atomic apocalypse the United States visited on Japan, we are again reminded that the policymakers in Washington are afflicted with what Chalmers Johnson described as the amnesia of imperial powers. We don't recall that at the root of the present crisis is the Korean War, a brutal, 
dirty and unresolved war that's never been resolved with a peace treaty. A war that's ironically known in this country for being forgotten, but that set a paradigm for subsequent U.S. wars of intervention to follow. Few in the mid 20th century during a time of McCarthyism registered opposition to the Korean War. There were exceptions. Paul Robeson was one. Yeah. In a critique of what he called American armed adventure in Korea that resonates to this day, he lambasted his fellow citizens' meek conformity with the policies of the war-minded, the racists, the rich. Robeson unflinchingly observed that the maw of war makers was insatiable in Korea. In, oh, Hannah, I hear you. Yeah. Um, in an asymmetrical conflict in which the United States monopolized the skies, raining down ruin down from on high, four million Koreans, the vast majority civilians, were killed. Chinese statistics, and I want this to sink in, indicate that North Korea lost an unimaginable 30% of its population. Oh, wow. Civilian infrastructure was not spared. Dams, schools, any standing structure was deemed to be fair game. And American bombers indeed complained that there was nothing left to bomb. Oh. As the historian Bruce Cummings notes, it was during this period that North Koreans, whom he describes as the party of memory, learned how to live below ground. Three days into the war, Truman slapped a set of punitive sanctions against North Korea, and these were not an alternative to war. They were an explicit part of his war policy. North Korea, to this day, remains the most heavily sanctioned nation on this earth. Against the conditions of the 1953 armistice agreement, the United States maintains roughly 30,000 forces and about 100 military installations south of the DMZ. For the entirety of its existence, and I want to underscore this, North Korea has been subjected to a reg regime change policy from the United States. Back in the day, they called it rollback, right? And let's also remember that in keeping with the conditions of the armistice agreement, China withdrew its forces. Just as most Americans don't register that the United States test launched a Minuteman III ICBM from Vandenberg last week in a show of force aimed at North Korea. And although this was timed in response to the North Korean second ICBM launch, this is something that is routine. And let's recall that in terms of the proliferation of the military industrial complex, North Korea has functioned as a very convenient ruse, even though what the United States has achieved by, through its anti-North Korea policy is the encirclement of China. China is nobody's fool. It knows who the real target of the United States is. So just as most Americans don't register that that Minuteman III um, was test launched from Vandenberg, so too do most Americans not know that at mid-century, most um, MacArthur, General MacArthur contemplated dropping between 30 and 50 atomic bombs strung across the neck of Manchuria in order to create a zone of cobalt where no one could live for approximately 100 years, thus making impossible a Chinese advance from the north. The United States has threatened North Korea with nuclear annihilation on at least a dozen occasions. When, the Nor when North Korea captured the crew of the Pueblo in the late 60s, when Colin pra Powell threatened to turn North Korea into a charcoal briquette, when North Korea was added to the list of permissible preemptive targets in the 2002 nuclear posture review in the George W. Bush axis of evil era, when Obama announced that he was sending two stealth bombers to drop dummy nuclear munitions off the Korean Peninsula in a simulated preemptive nuclear strike against North Korea, when Trump administrations repeatedly declare that all options are on the table, and when the United States against the terms of the Armistice Agreement um, housed nuclear weapons in the southern part of the peninsula. This, these conditions are at the structural root of North Korea's proliferation. Right. In this time of unprecedented danger, we have to be ruthless, not in our threats, but in our pursuit of truth. Courageous, not with our swords, but in our willingness to confront our own historical denial. We have to recognize that North Korea does not require further U.S. intervention. So the question before us today 
is what does a genuine peace with North Korea mean? Unsurprisingly, few media outlets have reported on North Korea's overtures to the United States. And I'll say that when it comes to North Korea, the media is truly fake news, okay? Um, but these overtures, if pursued, might result in meaningful de-escalation on both sides. And this is to say that there are peaceful alternatives at hand. Far from being an intractable foe, North Korea has repeatedly asked the United States to sign a peace treaty that would bring the Korean War to a long overdue end. It has also proposed that the United States cease its annual war games with South Korea. And these are games that rehearse the simulated invasion and occupation of North Korea, perform the decapitation of its leadership, and also rehearse a preemptive nuclear strike. Can we imagine if the United States would put up with this and say it's business as usual if Russia and Cuba were to do this? Would they say it's not provocative? Um, in return, and this is what North Korea also says, your, they have said war is not a game. Okay. In return, North Korea has offered to cap its nuclear testing. Okay, a suspension of provocative war games that are the largest in the world for a suspension of nuclear testi testing, thus de-escalating the current situation. China and Russia have reiterated this proposal. And so I want to say, in the middle part of the 20th century, too many Americans were silent. We cannot and we must not be silent now. Shalom, peace, salam, shalom.